Kia ora koutou katoa. Welcome to this third Tasman District Council webinar on Aoriri ki uta, Aoriri ki tai, Tasman Environment Plan. This webinar focuses on Tasman's freshwater and coastal environments. Today I'm joined by Lisa McGlinchey, McGlinchey and Stephanie Stiles, who will be doing a short presentation on where we are up to with marine and freshwater aspects of the plan and what we are currently asking people to provide feedback on. Lisa is responsible for the freshwater portfolio and leads the natural resources team working with air, land, freshwater and coastal parts of the regional plan. Steph is assisting with the coastal portfolio and is looking at strategic planning needs in the coastal environment. Feel free to type in, in any questions that you have as you watch the presentation and we'll address these during the presentation if we get the chance, otherwise we'll answer them at the end. I'll now pass you over to Lisa and Steph to take you through the key aspects of From the Mountains to the Sea, Tasman's Freshwater and Coastal Environments. Thanks Andrew, yeah, I'm Lisa and um, today we're going to go through the context for our freshwater and coastal management in terms of the legislation and national direction we have, um, then we'll go over the specific input that we're after in this engagement round um, and why we need that um, and then we'll have that question and answer session at the end. So I'm just going to jump straight into the context in terms of our national direction for both our freshwater and coastal management and I'll ask Steph to cover off some of our um, coastal slides. Um, so we are creating a new um, natural resource plan for the Tasman area, the Tasman Environment Plan. Um, currently this is under the Resource Management Act um, and this includes both our regional policy statement and our resource management plan. Um, so this is the first time in 20 years that we've actually looked at these plans in this level of detail. So it's a really great um, opportunity for the community to get involved and um, give us some direction on what we should be doing differently. Um, sometimes this is a bit confused with the long-term plans. So this is quite different. Uh, that's done under the Local Government Act. Um, and the Tasman Environment Plan, um, it influences how our urban and rural areas grow and develop. It also influences how we share and use our natural resources. Um, and how we can protect and restore our environment. Um, but there is a lot of change coming. So we've just had um, the bills for the proposed Spatial Planning Act and Natural and Built Environment Acts, which are going to replace the Resource Management Act. Um, and we've also had direction that we are to combine our plans with Nelson um, region. So as part of that, we are, um, will be providing a regional spatial strategy for both regions, as well as um, a natural and built environment plan um, covering both regions. Um, there's still some further work coming from the government on this. There will be a national planning framework um, and also a third act, the Climate Adaption Act, which will affect things. And also under the Natural and Built Environments Act, there's provision for a freshwater working group that is going to be looking specifically at, at water allocation. Um, so there's still quite a bit of uncertainty around the timeframes um, for this process. But I guess the, the main message here is, is the issues that we're addressing in Tasman are going to remain the same. And um, while the outcomes might have some more government direction, um, the visions and values that we're seeking from the community will be important regardless of what legal framework uh, the plan will be developed under. Um, the other thing that won't really change is the process that we go through to develop the plan. So we have some quite key steps for the development of the plan. Um, our first one is to look back at the old plan, the Tasman Resource Management Plan, to see what worked and what hasn't. Um, then we had a look at the high level issues to see if they've changed. Um, the next phase we go into um, having a look in a bit more depth at those issues and consider the options that we have to address those. Um, and at each of these steps we um, seek um, feedback from the community, so your thoughts on where we've landed. The feedback from um, that options process will then allow us to uh, develop a draft plan which then goes out um, for further feedback from the community um, and we use that feedback to create a proposed version of the plan that then gets publicly notified um, and that takes us through the legal bit with public submissions and hearings. Um, and then out the back end of that, we get a shiny new operative plan and we can all go out and enjoy the Tasman sunshine. Um, so in terms of where we're at in this process, um, we did our backward looking review at the old plan in 2019, 2020. Um, we went out to the community in 2020 to discuss the high level issues. Um, and this round of engagement is looking at our urban and rural development um, options. Um, 
We've also got um, the same questions around our natural resources, so air, land, water and the coast, and we'll be coming out to the communities to talk about the options for those um, later in 2023. Um, but alongside both of this, we also have the freshwater framework um, to implement. So this is a quite a specific process identified for us under the National Policy State for Freshwater. Um, and the intention is that this will um, feed into both the options assessment and the development of the draft plan. In terms of national direction, we've got two key policy statements that are directing our management frameworks for coastal environments and freshwater. That's the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement and the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management from 2020. Um, in addition, there's a, a number of other policy statements that the plan needs to um, give effect to, as well as a whole bunch of regulations and standards, particularly for the freshwater, um, with more coming. Um, and the plan sort of seeks to avoid duplicating these. They act as sort of a set of national rules. Um, uh, and we only include stuff in the plan where we might need more, more stringent rules. Um, the other key change that's come through the national policy statement is the concept of Tamanu Te Wai. Um, this relates to the fundamental of importance of water to, to everything and everyone um, and it captures the idea that to have healthy communities we also need healthy water. Um, within the Te Manu Te Wai, there are six principles that inform its implementation. The first three there are focused on the role of Tangata Whenua Māori in managing fresh water um, and the second three there are looking at non-Māori um, involvement but there's a lot of parallels between those principles. Um, and the second part of it is the hierarchy of obligations. So this is in terms of our decisions on fresh water, um, the health of water bodies needs to be our first priority. Human health needs, including things like drinking water, uh, are our second priority, and all other values and uses of water follow. Steph, I'll hand over to you for coastal strategic planning. Thanks, Lisa. Yes, so in the coastal space, the key drivers, as Lisa pointed out, under the RMA, are the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement. And one of the initial parts of that directs us to do strategic planning for the coastal environment. So the key reasons why we need to think about it strategically are to ensure that we've got that integration of activities. There's a lot going on in the coastal environment, both the wet bits and the dry edges. There's a lot of different competing in interests and issues and we need to be strategic in understanding how those activities and uses can work together or where decisions need to be made. And what it comes down to quite simply is deciding what is appropriate and what is inappropriate. We've got a lot of special places and values in that coastal environment. We need to protect those special areas from inappropriate activities. And then we need to provide for the appropriate activities to grow and flourish. A key overlap in the coastal strategic planning is the link to the coastal management project, which is looking at the long term planning for sea level rise and how to manage coastal hazards. So obviously, that's a massive issue for the whole of New Zealand and all of our coastlines where we've got a lot of change happening already and a lot of growing knowledge of the need to be preparing for change that will come over coming years. So we're working those two projects in parallel at this stage. In time, we'll need to use what we find from things like the modeling and the resilience approaches, the responses to change, to drive some of the decisions around where our strategy is for what happens in that coastal area. Thanks, Steph. Um, there's also further information on that coastal management project on Council's website, and there's also uh, links to that project on our Shape Tasman site if you want more information on that um, particularly. So I'll just move on now to um, the specific input that we're interested in getting from you all through this engagement round. Um, and I guess the, the fundamental message is that the visions and values um, that we hear from the community will direct our, our water management, both in the freshwater and in the coastal environment space. Um, and the first part of that is, is about where those frameworks will apply. So in the freshwater space, um, the this, this sort of spatial unit where we apply those frameworks is, um, are called freshwater management units. Um, and in the coastal area, it's the coastal environment. 
So in terms of um, the next step, we'll be setting our goals. So that's the vision and values that we're seeking from you and they will inform the outcomes that are included in the new plan. Um, following on from that, we'll be looking at rules and provisions about land, water and coastal use that seek to achieve those outcomes. Um, and this will determine things like what needs a resource consent in Tasman, what standards, limits and criteria need to be met through those processes when you're undertaking activities. Um, and it also provides policy direction for decision makers. Um, in terms of the freshwater um, framework, we also have a requirement under the National Policy Statement um, for action plans where there are freshwater issues, so where we identify degrading water quality, or any habitat issues, um, things like that. Um, we need to put in place action plans to address those. Um, and we're also seeking to support existing community efforts um, to improve the health of our water bodies and coastal areas. So Steph, I'll hand over to you for coastal environment mapping. Yes, so the, the coastal environment and the outward edge goes out to the, the edge of the, the region, which is the um, outer limit, the coastal outer limit, so 12 nautical miles. So it's a very large spatial area. Um, and on the inward landward edge, it's what we'd call the coastal environment line, which defines the space of the foreshore and coastal edge that is dominated by coastal processes. So it's, it's quite a, a complex process. There's policies within the New Zealand Coastal Policy Statement that set out direction of how to define that inland edge. And we used experts who do this around the country to work through a process of looking at all of the different characteristics and values and different layers of information and they produced a report and a draft, <clears throat> excuse me, mapped line in 2021. And the line, which you can see on that map to the, to the side there is the, the black line. You can see in many cases, it's very close to the coastal edge. In some cases, it comes well inland. And that represents the different types of attributes that different areas have. Sometimes the, the location of that coastal environment line is driven by things like coastal hazards, sometimes by vegetation, sometimes it's geological. And that's why we use the experts to define that. Following that draft mapping and reporting, we carried out a period of public consultation. We ran open days and had different meetings with landowners and different stakeholders. We had a couple of rounds of that. We got interrupted by COVID a few times. And when we finally managed to get all of the conversations held, we got an amended report and an amended set of mapping done earlier this year, refinements made and changes to that line to reflect greater levels of understanding that came through that process. So those amended maps and the amended reporting is available again on Council's website and on the Shape Tasman website and if anyone's interested in seeing what's changed that's identified through the mapping and also the values and qualities that underline why the line is where it is are in that reporting associated with it. There's a question that's come through Steph that you might be able to answer that relates to this which is um, can I get the coastal environment line changed? The answer is maybe. It depends on where and why. So mm -hmm. we've done a lot of conversations with people, but of course we're always open to more if there's a good reason of something we don't know about a site or an area, something that's not been highlighted strongly enough. We're more than happy to, to talk to people about those issues. Um, there's the, uh, the ability to contact us through, again, that Shape Tasman page, which has got the, the feedback options and the, um, environment plan email address. So we're happy to hear from anyone on that. Great, thank you. Thanks, Steph. So in terms of our freshwater um, spatial management units, um, these have been based on the catchments, so where the water flows. Uh, we've also looked at the surface and groundwater interactions within each of these areas. So that's um, where sort of uh, surface water gets lost to groundwater, but also where groundwater actually recharges back into rivers 
um, and considering things like springs and wetland connections as well. Um, we've also grouped the surface water catchments um, that flow into the same coastal receiving environments in the same freshwater management unit. So um, an example of that is around the Waimea Inlet. Um, we've also grouped um, communities with shared interests and an example, um, I'll show you, hopefully you can see my cursor there, is the Wainui um, catchment over in Golden Bay. Um, so in the past that's been looked at in the Abel Tasman but we've we realised that it had uh, the Wainui community has more of a connection with um, those on the Takaka on the other side of the hill, so they've been um, included together. Um, and in some areas, we've also looked at the specific management needs of the, um, each of the catchments. Um, within the freshwater management units, we will also be looking at using some smaller um, sub catchment management zones to look at issues such as allocation and water quality in a bit more detail. So there's been eight freshwater management units proposed in Tasman. We have the Aorere West Coast there in red, um, the Takaka in orange, the Able Tasman Kai Territory in the dark green, um, Motueka Riwaka in the blue, Mutari in the pink, Waimea in the peachy colour, and the Upper Bula Kawateri in the green. Um, we also have um, a quite a special FMU in Tasman and this is that dotted line there which shows the deep motor groundwater um, and that um, freshwater management unit focuses on two very deep um, aquifers so sort of 700 to 800 meters deep to get down to those um, and the, the interactions with the ground um, with the surface water is sort of a lot more limited than in our other um, FMUs and takes a long time so that one's got quite different management challenges than a lot of our other freshwater management units so it, it's um, been set as its own. Um, and in terms of the feedback that we're seeking on the freshwater management units on Shape Tasman, um, we want your feedback on have we got the boundaries right and also do you agree with the catchment grouping? So um, there's uh, space on um, Shape Tasman to put in your thoughts and if you think there should be changes to outline what those should be. Um, in terms of the freshwater management units, um, the guidance from the Ministry of Environment is that they need to be big enough to be efficient um, but also small enough to effectively apply the management framework. Um, and one thing I'll note before I go on, this slide also shows um, conservation land in the darker green. Um, and you can sort of see in terms of some of the freshwater management units, and the bull is a good example, there's actually, despite the fact that this is actually quite a big um, catchment area, uh, the area of land that's not in conservation land is actually quite small. So the, this lighter coloured green here is quite a bit smaller than, say, for example, the area of land in the Motuikere Waka um, that's not in conservation land. So moving on, um, in terms of visions, um, so this is, um, these will be based in terms of uh, freshwater and our freshwater management units and the coastal area right across the coastal environment. Um, visions are statements about um, how we want the future to be um, and the intention is that the new plan will seek to achieve um, those visions. Um, they sort of act as touchstones to make sure that our freshwater and coastal management is heading in the right direction over time. Um, and they need to be possible but aspirational. Um, but we recognise that achieving these will take time and it will take commitment from everybody. So in terms of um, answering our questions around visions, I guess that we're asking you to think about um, you know, how you want Tasman's freshwater and coastal environments to be for the future and for future generations. Um, and on Shape Tasman, there's some prompting questions about having a think about how you and your family and friends feel about our freshwater and coastal areas, um, how you use water in everyday life, um, whether you are happy about the state of our freshwater bodies, happy with your access to them, things like that. Um, and I guess imagining visiting some of your favourite freshwater or salty places, um, say in 10 years or 30 years or 100 years, and what would you like to see or feel or do, um, and what would you change if you could, how is it different from now? So um, there's space on um, online at Shape Tasman, um, and we've asked for visions um, separately across both freshwater and the coastal areas um, across those 10 year, 30 year and 100 year timeframes. Steph, did you have anything you wanted to add? Yeah, I think all I'd like to add on that is that we're we really conscious that it's hard to think far in the future. It's hard to know where anyone will be, even 10 years sometimes. But think, think about what it means for your children or your friends and family's children in, in the future, because the decisions we make now 
and those decisions of what we want the vision to be like in 10 years will influence where we go in those longer time frames. So try, try to put yourself into future shoes and think about how you want those spaces to be. Thanks. So the next um, piece of uh, feedback we'd love to get is your values of water. So we've based these on um, the values that are in the National Policy Statement for Freshwater Management. Um, that gives us four compulsory values that need to apply in every water body in the region. Um, but there's also eight other national values that we need to consider in Tasman as well. Um, we've used the same approach for coastal because as we were considering it, we realised that in terms of the definitions of the values, except um, for drinking water, um, they, the rest of them could equally apply in the coastal areas as they do for fresh water bodies. Um, but we're not limited to just those, we can include any other values that are identified by the community. Um, and to give you some examples, we've included 11 additional values that were identified through the Nelson um, draft plan process. Um, but there's also opportunity to um, include your own. So. Online at Shape Tasman, we have this um, interactive map here um, and you can add markers to that map to uh, show us the places that are important to you and let us know why they're important. So these are the values that I just mentioned. So the, these are the four compulsory values. I won't go through these, um, but they are um, defined um, and outlined in the national policy statement. Um, these are the um, eight other national values that we must also consider for Tasman. Um, and these are the 11 um, values that were identified through the Nelson process. Um, in addition to that, we've also added resilience to climate change. And in that interactive map, there's the option to drop um, a marker with other and actually add your own value and definition. Um, and um, short definitions for all of these values are also available on, on Shape Tasman. Steph, I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Lisa. Uh, another key thing that we're really wanting to get feedback on from everyone is around the, the pressures, the threats and the activities. Change seems to be happening faster and faster all the time. And we're really conscious that we need to gather information from the community around how people feel about that change and what activities you feel are placing pressure on your freshwater and coastal environments now and what you see as placing increasing pressure in the future. So we've, we've framed the feedback questions around this in terms of what kind of things do you feel are appropriate, necessary, good in the, in the, in the different spaces, the, the fresh and salty water areas, what kind of things do you think those environments can cope with and that fit the values that you and others hold of those spaces? And at what point do those activities or other activities stop being okay? What's not okay? You know, we've, we've got a, a strong pressure for coastal living and coastal growth. At what point does that not work for the wider community and the environment? When is too much too far? And again, we've provided some more guidance on this and some pointed questions on the Shape Tasman website. We're really keen to know what each person thinks are the current future and future pressures. So again, thinking uh, forward into the future, thinking about what you can see happening now and perhaps imagining what you don't want to see and what those inappropriate activities might be in those special places. Thanks, Steph. So just to summarise in terms of the feedback on Shape Tasman, we're after your thoughts on the boundaries and catchment groupings for our freshwater management units, um, your visions for both freshwater and coastal areas across those 10, 30 and 100 year timeframes, uh, your values of water both in the freshwater and coastal environment, and we've got that interactive map where you can drop those, um, those markers in both both the freshwater and the coastal areas. <clears throat> and you can also add your own values. Um, and we've got a page looking specifically at pressures 
on freshwater and coastal areas. Um, so this feedback round closes on the 12th of December, so we'd love to hear from you before then. Um, when you go on to the um, Shape Tasman site, you'll see um, the from the mountains to the sea section and that includes all of our questions on the freshwater and coastal environment um, but also feel free we're keen on getting your feedback on um, managing our Tasman environment and development which covers our urban and rural development questions um, and we also have some specific questions on our towns and villages in terms of their growth and development so um, we'd love to hear from you on all of them um, but if you're just interested in the freshwater and coastal feedback it's this mountains to the sea one and we're into our question and answer session. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Steph and Lisa. Um, very comprehensive presentation there on the um, freshwater and marine area. Um, we'll launch into some of the questions that we've been getting um, from the people that are watching this. Um, for the question and answer session, we're also being joined by Mary Honey. Um, Mary's the outlier here. She's an urban planner, really. So she's responsible for towns and local centres and terrestrial biodiversity portfolios. But we thought we'd get her along just in case we got any questions that were um, that would need her expertise. Um, so we've got some questions here um, for you, Steph and Lisa. Um, I'll roll a couple together here. There's a question that's come in saying, um, have other areas done coastal strategic documents? And it kind of goes with the next one, which is what might a vision for the coastal environment sound like? Yeah, the, the answer to that is yes, absolutely. A lot of the regions, many of the regions around New Zealand have looked at what is a coastal strategy, many of many different ways that that's been looked at. Um, and yet a lot of similarity when it comes to what the visions are that are expressed. The, the most common expression of the vi visions that people have for the coastal environments shows a balance between use and protection. So there's a lot of wording around protecting the special places, protecting the values that make the coastal area special. And there's a lot of wording around the ability to grow and use and both make money from and get enjoyment from the coastal spaces. So We've got a lot of information around the country that we can draw on. It's really at this stage, what we're looking for is feedback on how to localize that to Tasman. Tasman's a very, very special coastal space. It's an amazing place. And we really want to, to take that generality of how the rest of the country looks at their coastal spaces and apply it in a local context. Thanks for that, Steph. Um, there's a couple of questions that have come up here that kind of fit together nicely as well. Um, I don't know if the people here know, but I do a little bit of fishing off the coast here in the Nelson and Tasman region. So there's a question that's very topical, um, given the weather events that we've had recently. And someone's asking, what about sedimentation affecting the bays? And I think we should tack that in with another question, which is around, um, will the coastal environment rules consider boat access points? Yeah, absolutely. Those are a number of the, the very important issues that we'll have to work our way through. Um, the sedimentation issue isn't just a coastal issue, it's a very prominent issue for the freshwater spaces. Gen generally, that's how it gets there. And it's, it's definitely an issue that's foremost in many people's minds. Tackling that is not simple, but it is definitely something that we've got on our a long list of issues that we need to resolve and work through and probably not resolve quickly because they're never simple issues. Boat yeah. access ramps, definitely on the list, Andrew. Don't worry. Great, great. Um, there's a question here, Lisa, that relates back to um, some of the points that you covered early on in the presentation, and that is how are iwi being involved in the freshwater process? That's a good question. Um, so we've actually got a separate um, process that we're working through with iwi right across the top of the south. Uh, we have a collaborative group called Te Puna Kōrero Ki Te Tau Ihu, uh, and that includes uh, the eight iwi across the top of the south, 
plus all three councils. So that's Tasman, um, Nelson and Marlborough. Um, and we've been working together for a while now. And the intention of that um, collaborative process is to um, discuss uh, how we can create a freshwater fr framework that can be applied across the top of the south that gives effect to Tamanal Te Wai as a concept. So um, the outcomes from that process will feed through to the, um, the planned development, both for Nelson and Tasman and also for Marlborough. Great, thank you for that, Lisa. Um, just looking through the other questions that we've got. Uh, there's a quick, simple one here. Um, and I've actually, we've been doing some engagements around the Tasman region in some of the, the, the towns and villages. And this one has actually come up in a couple of places. Someone has asked, can the plan ban dogs in coastal areas? <laughs> ah, dogs on beaches, cars on beaches, very topical issue. Um, not unique to Tasman, a topical issue around the country. There's, it, it's not a simple one. There's many different uses and sometimes dogs on beaches aren't a bad thing. It's more about the right or wrong time in the wrong place. So one of the, issue, one of the, the layers of work that we're working through is around the biodiversity values of the coastal space, whether it be marine or estuarine or terrestrial on land or in the water and working out what's special when it's special because often some of the issues with dogs arise around conflict with bird habitats amongst many things and so at some times of the year there's more likelihood of conflict than others so once we've got all of the information around what's going on where we can start to make some decisions around whether there needs to be controls on things like dogs and walking even, cars and other access. There are other tools that the council can use. So things like bylaws are often a good tool to control access in those public spaces. And also remembering we've also got to make sure that we ensure that there is still public access where that's appropriate and where it needs to be. So the presumption is that the coastal marine area is a public space and needs to be accessible for the public. Thanks for that Steph. I know the people that I've talked to it's been conflict with birds primarily that's the that's the driving force between between behind that. Um, there's a couple of slightly more technical questions that have come in here and um, I'm re I realize that we are not trying to dig down to sort of individual issues or questions here, but it's much more about the visions and values, but we'll address these anyway. Um, this one's fairly topical in the plains around Richmond. Uh, what are the likely changes for water permit holders in the new framework? Um, oh, that's a good question and a, a little bit difficult to answer right now. Um, it will quite depend on um, sort of the current context of the water permit, but also which um, freshwater management unit they are in. Um, in terms of the requirements under the national policy statement, the plan must include um, allocation limits for each freshwater management unit. Um, and as we work through the freshwater management units in Tasman, if we find any of those areas are over allocated for water, then that would result in a need to, um, to claw back in terms of existing permits to get into a um, sort of an at allocation uh, position instead of over allocated. Um, we also have a requirement under the NPS to include um, minimum flows for each freshwater management unit um, and to protect those minimum flows and that's usually through rationing and cease take. So some of the permits in Tasman do not have um, cease takes currently. Uh, that process is driven through our dry weather task force that makes decisions um, during droughts depending on um, what the forecast going forward is and what the needs are. Um, so that aspect may change in terms of people having cease takes um, included in their future water permits um, and that may have an effect for uh, the security of water for some of those permits and in some places that may um, result in a need for um, sort of contingency planning in terms of things like uh, greater harvest and storage of water to see th people through um, drought conditions um, and that's something we're conscious of in terms of the plan development to um, um, incorporate um, a sort of a clear and easy track for allowing people to put in um, water storage. Thanks for that, Lisa. It's um, 
certainly an important one that in terms of both or particularly freshwater when it comes to the impacts of climate change and how we're going to mitigate some of those and address them. Um, there's a question coming here. I think you've probably covered some of this in the presentation, but I'll ask it anyway. And it says, what are the project areas that make up the coastal portfolio and which will contribute to achieving the coastal vision? Mm, yes, we have touched on that, but it's, it's, it's a good question to work through. The coastal policy statement provides specific policy direction on many topics that need to be addressed. So we've got separate work streams that come under those. Essentially, we're seeing the, the strategic planning and that, that vision and value setting as the umbrella and the overall direction. And then under that, we've got the various work streams. And amongst many things, they include things like the natural character values and the landscape values. Um, we've got the biodiversity values, as I said before, both on the land in that marginal estuarine areas and out in the, the marine environment. We've got topical use type issues such as aquaculture and marine farming. And we've got issues that arise commonly around the edge with things like structures, whether it be seawalls, boat ramps, boat sheds, jetties and those kind of things. We've got to look at issues of the private use of public space. So we'll get into questions at some point around things like coastal occupancy, who should get to occupy that space. Um, and then we've got things like the cultural and heritage overlays that also come into that coastal space. So those have got their own work streams under the environment plan process, but where the results of those impact on the coastal space we'll need to integrate those issues as well. And I guess you could see it all as one big jigsaw puzzle and how those all work together is what's going to drive the ability to implement those visions and values at that higher level. Mm. And I'll add, I add to that actually that a good example of that's in the coastal water quality space. So that's very much, um, while there's um, sort of discharges that can occur uh, wholly in the marine space, a large chunk of that is affected by what is coming off the land. Um, and discharges um, from land use activities. So the, the new plan um, will have sections looking at um, erosion and sediment control, um, land disturbance and earthworks. Um, and certainly we have direction, um, both from the national policy statement for fresh water to look at receiving environment effects, but also from the New Zealand coastal policy statement also directs us to look upstream at sediment sources. So yeah, that'll definitely be covered. Thank you for that. That was a very comprehensive answer. Um, I think we've probably got one last question that's come in here. And this is a, a great phrase that I haven't come across, but is fairly self-explanatory. Um, someone has asked, what is meant by drinking from nature as a value of water? Yep. Um, so this is something we modified a little bit from the Nelson plan process. So in that process, they called it uh, Wai Māori. But essentially, it's an aspirational value to um, be able to drink from any water body um, and, and um, not get sick. And I guess I would um, compare this to the likes of trampers going, you know, tramping in our national parks and being able to drink from a water body as they cross it and, um, and know that they won't get ill. Um, I guess in terms of the challenge in, in setting this value, it's recognising that there are natural sources of, um, sort of pathogens and disease causing organisms that can be found in water. And in particular, the um, E. coli indicator that we use to indicate the presence of those can also have natural sources such as um, birds, uh, wildfowl, ducks, that kind of thing. Um, and, and also there are some challenges in terms of we know that some of our water bodies have cryptosporidium um, and giardia um, issues and, you know, um, whether or not it's actually feasible to um, reduce or get rid of those from catchments um, to make them safer. So, um, yeah, it's, it's certainly a, um, been seen as an aspirational um, goal for Nelson and um, we've included it in the Shape Tasman um, map so that um, Tasman can have the opportunity to say whether they think that's something that we should be looking at in our region too. Great, thank you for that Lisa. Um, I think that's it for questions for now, I just don't think we've had any more come in. So we'll probably look at wrapping the presentation and the seminar up here. Um, just wanted to reiterate what Lisa has said and Steph has mentioned, which is that we're really interested in getting people's feedback on these um, visions and values for the freshwater and coastal spaces. 
Um, there's a lot of ways that you can provide that feedback. So one of the main ones would be going to the Shape Tasman website. You can see the web address there at the bottom of the screen, shape.tasman.govt.nz forward slash environment plan. And that takes you to the web page, which has the um, a link through to the freshwater and marine aspects of this, the Tasman environment plan and the towns and villages. You can email us. Um, there are hard copies of all the documents that go along with this process of engagement. So you can pick those up from any TDC service center and you can fill those in. You can post them back to us. You can drop them back into those service centers. You can um, email us environmentplan at tasman.govt.nz. And um, we're also doing small pop-up engagements all the way around the region. And you're more than welcome to come along to one of those and grab us and have a chat. Um, we did one in the village of Tasman this afternoon. I know we're out in Wakefield tomorrow, and there's a bit of a list of the other places that we're going on the Shape Tasman website. So thank you very much for attending this webinar. Um, thank you to Steph and Lisa for um, being our experts on hand. And um, thank you to um, Mary, even though we didn't need her. And um, yes, thank you very much. Namihi.